On the 14th of July, 1914, Archduke Franz Ferdinand, heir to the Austro-Hungarian Empire, is assassinated in Sarajevo. No one, least the assassin, could have imagined the consequences of the crime. Four years later, there would be no empires. A new system of nation-states would be created, a new form of diplomacy established, and new powers emerged. In between lay mass conflagration, incalculable human suffering, and a heretofore unknown horror. Modern industrial war. The prince was only the first casualty of a conflict that was to claim 20 million lives. Historians debate the causes of the Great War to this day. There are many. But by 1914, the delicate balance of power that provided a hundred years of relative peace and stability in Europe had been tipped. Foreign policy made way for military grand strategy. Events were now determined by mindless technocratic war plans that gambled on a single throw of the dice and that once triggered, unleashed a doomsday machine. As preparations for war began, the alliances that had previously provided stability now dragged the rival empires of Europe collectively toward the abyss by guaranteeing that each would be forced to mobilize in succession. Once the flames of war were fanned, there was no turning back. In 1904, France and Britain signed a pact of cooperation against the perceived threat of Germany, the Entente Cordiale. Concerned about a joint attack from France, Britain and Russia, the German Army Chief of Staff Count Alfred von Schlieffen was instructed to devise a war plan to counter such an attack. He calculated that Russia would take six weeks to mobilize. In this time, France could be crushed with overwhelming force so that both Russia and Britain would lose their appetite to carry on the fight. It was a brilliant plan on paper. 90% of the German forces would be devoted to the attack on France. A small force would hold the line in the south while a massive right flank in the north would rush through Holland and Belgium, enveloping the fortified eastern border of France and entrapping Paris by rolling up its defenders from the northwest. The German army would finally crush the remaining French forces against the Swiss border. Schlieffen's successor, Count Helmut von Moltke, made final alterations to the plan. He decided to lead the northern attack through the narrow hills of Belgium, hoping that Britain would not intervene if Holland's neutrality was left intact. Most importantly, he reduced the forces dedicated to Schlieffen's hammer-fist right flank. On August 2, 1914, the plan was put to test. Germany invaded Belgium and Luxembourg. Buoyed by successes in Belgium, the Germans pressed the initiative sweeping the dispirited and exhausted Allied troops before them. By early September 1914, the German first and second armies were within 30 miles of Paris. The French government had already abandoned the capital and French and British troops had fallen back to positions south of the Marne River. The capture of Paris seemed imminent. The German generals sensed that victory was within their grasp. But the French commander, Marshal Joseph Joffre, had a card up his sleeve. Joffre knew that the Germans were at the limit of their supply lines, and that though exhausted, the French army remained unbroken. He quickly reformed a new offensive mass, made up of troops redeployed from the east. Lacking the concentration of troops northwest of Paris, envisaged in Schlieffen's original plan, Joffre was able to lure the German forces south and east, away from Paris. The maneuver exposed a 30-mile wide gap into the German lines between General von Kluck's 
and General von Bülow's armies that was detected by British reconnaissance aircraft. It was the chance that Joffre had been waiting for. He ordered an immediate counterattack to roll up the German right flank. Troops from the British Expeditionary Force and the French Fifth Army rushed into the gap between the German armies. The military governor of Paris, General Joseph Gallieni, rushed the Paris garrison to the front in 600 commandeered taxicabs. The French rallied behind Le Taxi de la Monde, and Allied resistance stiffened. General Ferdinand Foch, positioned near the center of the battle, in command of the French 9th Army, sent the now famous dispatch. My center is giving way. My right is in retreat. Situation excellent. I attack. Joffre's calculated risk had paid off. The German advance stalled, and they were forced to withdraw to the Chemie de Dam north of the Aisne River. Moltke was blamed for the debacle at the Marne and suffered a nervous breakdown. He was replaced by General Erich von Falkenheim. The casualties sustained by the French in the first three months of the war were unlike anything ever experienced in the history of warfare. 455,000 French troops were killed, almost a third of all French casualties sustained during the war. German casualties were heavy as well, with over 220,000 dead. The losses in the First World War are tragic, I suppose, in, for one one reason, or one possible reason, is that this was seen by some generals as an attritional war, particularly on the French side. The idea being that if there was one Frenchman left standing when all the Germans were dead, then it was a successful war. With the end of the Battle of the Marne died German hopes of a quick victory. Moreover, France had just won a sensational defensive victory and remained materially strong. Both sides dug in for a protracted fight. Massive defensive systems were constructed, comprising layered trench positions, protected by barbed wire and machine gun positions with interlocking fields of fire, and supported by batteries of heavy artillery. This system of trench fortifications stretched in one continuous line for 475 miles from the North Sea to Switzerland. Knowing that Falkenhayn was being forced to pull troops from the Western Front to reinforce the campaign in the East, the Allies sensed an opportunity. They focused their offensives of 1915 on Flanders in the north and Chemi de Dam in the south. The attacks were designed to pinch the long salient between Flanders and Verdun and cut the rail links with Germany. Both were bloody and pointless failures. 1915 was a doleful year for the Allies on the Western Front. The Germans had shown that they had mastered the art of defending an entrenched front. Forward positions were manned lightly to avoid heavy casualties in an artillery barrage. The bulk of the troops was positioned in deep underground bunkers which were impervious to even the heaviest artillery or beyond artillery range from where powerful counter-offensives could be launched. The Allies simply demonstrated that they had learned nothing about how to break through. By Christmas 1915, Falkenhayn had convinced the Kaiser that France was close to the breaking point. A crushing defeat of the French army would force France to surrender. A limited offensive at a vital point that would compel the French to throw in every man they had and would bleed France white. Falkenhayn chose the French garrison town of Verdun for the attack. Verdun comprised